Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, being here with us today. Uh, we are on our part one of three of the analog to digital convergence. So today is going to be really um, only about the analog uh, workflow. Um, let me just remove the question from here. Does that go away? I need to wait. Fred? Okay, we're good. So um, this is the part one of three. So today we're going to talk about the analog workflow mostly. And um, it's, you know, I, I tended to call old school because I don't do this workflow so much anymore. But um, the reality is that there are still a lot of laboratories that do this um, on the analog way. So it's always important to know um, what, to, what to look for. Even if you're looking to start doing convergence, this is the best way to get started. All right, so what is the denture conversion? It's basically the ability of converting uh, the removable prosthesis into a fixed implant um, prosthesis. And that normally happens at the day of the surgery where the patient comes in, um, the surgeon removes the, um, the, the remaining uh, teeth, place the implants, multi-unit abutments, hopefully, and then we convert that denture, uh, picking up through a phase of picking up the cylinders and finishing all up. So the very first thing is about your team and um, how to communicate with them. And this is really important because I still get uncomfortable sometimes when I uh, start working with new practices that I, I don't know them. I don't know how they work, I don't know how they are. And I'm always afraid of that the communication is gonna fail and we are not gonna be successful. So um, the parts involved most of the time is the restorative dentist, the surgeon and the laboratory, the dental technician that goes um, for the conversion. There are some dentists that they place their own implants and that is okay too. But uh, when you are working with the Tim, what do you get? How do you get started? So you get all your impressions and, and photos and all the data from your um, restorative dentist, the one that refers you the case. So you start planning your case, you plan your denture. And again, this is pre-digital era. So we're talking about articulator, getting your impressions and set it on the articulator, take some photos and send it to the doctor to see if, he's agree see, to see if he agrees with what you are doing or not. And then once you're done, you can also provide your um, planning to the surgeon if he's doing guided surgery. Um, it's important for them to know what kind of changes you're doing on your um, on your side. If you're playing with the vertical dimension, uh, the tooth position, lip support, those are things that we need to consider every time we're planning the case. And again, before digital, there was not many ways to to just merge that data with the implant planning from um, the, the the surgeon, but you know, the very old school that I still remember doing this is if the patient has no teeth or if he's having a denture, we can definitely provide that information to the surgeon with, um, I, I think there's some stickers that you can glue on the denture uh, for the surgeon to just take a CVCT and a scan of that denture and merge everything with his implant planning. Or in this case, it was like small drops of Gouda Porcha. I don't even know if that still exists, but you just make, you place those markers on the denture, makes it radio opaque so they can see it on the scan and merge everything together. So some of the considerations, and there are a lot, but I just, I try, <laughs> sometimes I feel like a broken record. Um, every single time I mention this because I think that the success, a successful case it has to be, you have to consider this in order to have a successful case. And the very first one is the restorative space. And if we look at the all on floor, it's mostly, it fits on the FB3 type of restoration because most of the times we're replacing teeth and gums at the same time. So if you're looking at that in terms of a hybrid and hybrids is what I do the most um, in terms of finals, in terms of, uh, in order to do a, a hybrid, in terms of restorative space, you need at least 14 to 15 millimeters 
Um, and you know, those are some average numbers that you can you, you follow. Um, eight to ten millimeters of space will be for your teeth. And then once you fabricate the bar, it should have a minimum of uh, four millimeters of height. And then you still have an, you still need another two millimeters on the on the bottom to, to just wrap around um, that bar with acrylic. So if you're looking at the restorative space that you need 14 to 15 millimeters, uh, you have to take that into consideration when you're planning your venture. Bone reduction is also um, another one that we need to really focus on. And I know sometimes removing bone is something that we don't want. But if this was the, the, the case that we were um, asked to do and for not long for, we need to consider everything and that is one of them. So the first case, the first picture is not that dramatic. Once the, those crowns are pulled and the roots are out, um, you know, and then the gums, there's not much reduction there to do. But in some other cases where there's such an extreme changeable display, we need to really, really take that into consideration because we need to do all those changes um, on your pre-plan. So you are ready when you go to surgery, you have the right venture uh, for the conversion process. Another one will be the smile line um, that kind of goes with the transition zone. They're different, but uh, they kind of go together. You want to make sure that your um, bridge, your temporary um, line is not visible where, where your um, prosthesis and, and, and the gums of the patients. You don't want to see that transition. And this is an unfortunate case um, that it wasn't mine, but uh, it was a patient that a doctor um, called me, one of my doctors called me to see what we could do uh, for this patient. And unfortunately, you, <laughs> you already see the transition line there. And what you don't see is that that was already a flange. So the bone is probably by the zenith of those teeth. So unfortunately, there was nothing to do to that patient. It, everything had to be redone, remove the implants, remove um, uh, remove the bone and then just replant the whole case um, again. And this one is unfortunately one of my cases. And this was a case, well, not of my <laughs> a case that I did the denture for, but this doctor, it, he did um, kind of surgery, but he didn't take into consideration my planning. So uh, if you see, this is what um, I started with and I planned my denture. I, I, I focus on the, the restorative space and the bone reduction and all that. But once I got to the surgery, the doctor had ordered a, a surgical guide that was tooth born. Basically he just placed, he removed two or three teeth uh, in the anterior. He placed the guide on top of the posterior teeth and he just drilled the holes um, for, for the implant. So there was no, um, no merging of update on my planning to, to his, this, uh, with, with his, um, uh, planning. So this was the outcome and it's very unfortunate because there's not much we can do, um, in this case. So this is really big when you're planning this type of cases. Another one will be the tooth position versus the rich position. And this happens a lot when, I have doctors or when you might have doctors that request to do a conversion utilizing the patient's old denture. This is not mine. This was a doctor that called me. Well, I, I did a conversion and uh, I'm not sure why the cylinders are not staying in and that they're debonding. Well, you know, in this case, uh, the denture is really old. <laughs> the teeth are not in the right place and uh, it was very fragile. There was no uh, restorative space whatsoever. But if you see the relation between the, the tooth, the, where the teeth are and the implants are, they're not in the same level. And that is something that we cannot do. Another time, uh, another case is, um, again, this is when the patient is using, um, when you're converting uh, a venture that the patient already has, or even this, specific case, it was, um, I, the doctor just called me to do the conversion. I hadn't done the denture or the planning. They said that another lab did it and we could use that because it was great. And when we went to surgery, the tooth was not in the right position. So we ended up creating all that lip support, extra gummy lip support that is um, not good for the patient. And this is just another, this, 
um, this is just another case that the tooth position is not in the right place. And it, sometimes it might even be the type of restoration is not the appropriate. Once you see the lip rolling over that, um, over, over there, it means that it has too, many, too, too, too much of a shelf in there uh, or the teeth are out of the ridge. And sometimes even some cases, they can even have an olive core because they need the flange from the denture for um, the support of the lip. So um, the main thing with this considerations is that the conventional denture design is very different than the denture for conversion. And this is just a, fo a photo um, that I found from my, from my, 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 my old, old, old <laughs> phone that I had from my case, probably I needed to ask something to the doctor. And if this was to be an immediate denture, the tooth could only go in a certain position because you have all that bone um, in the way. So if you're planning this case for a conversion, then you have to understand how to remove um, bone and smooth the area for a proper um, planning of your, of your cases. And this, I don't know if you can see very well, but this is one of those cases that we end up using the patient's existing denture. And what fails here when you're doing that and you're not planning the case for an all on four for a final fixed restoration is that when you're picking your multi-unit abutments at uh, the next stage of the surgery, uh, you're trying to place those holes as closest to the teeth as possible. So if the teeth are not in the right position, uh, you're placing your multi-units in a different angle that it should be. And then at the very end, once you move to the final, your only way to fix this will be to redo the entire multi-unit choice and temporary in order to go to the final. So we're trying to avoid that when um, with, with the planning of the denture and then at the day of the surgery. So the checklist for the conversion, um, the different type of materials that we need, uh, of course, there's a lot more. You will need a handpiece. You'll need a, a, a polisher or um, something to finish your cases. But basically, this is something that I always carry or try to have in my bag every single time because some offices have something, some offices don't. And that will be the Blue Moose. Blue Moose is basically what we use to um, to to inject under the on the denture to to mark the, where the abutments are to start drilling the holes. Rubber dam, I don't use that anymore. Uh, some doctors have it in the office. They're used to that. They want to use that. And it's great to protect the, the, the tissue when we're doing the pickup. Um, there are other choices now that I'll present later on, but uh, that is something that you can use um, to protect the tissue once you're injecting the acrylic to make sure there's no extra acrylic going uh, through the sutures or the sockets or, or anywhere that you don't want it. Um, temporary cylinders, this, in my case, I don't provide the parts, um, the, the, the cylinders and the analogs, the, most of the times the surgeon um, has to provide that to, to the, to the restorative dentist, but um, it's important to know if your, 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 um, your doctors are expecting you to bring cylinders or not. In my case, I'm not expected to, to bring that, but if you need some sort of inventory, you need to know uh, what type of cylinders to bring to, to the surgery. And then you'll need acrylic for the pickup of the cylinders. Remember that your denture was traditionally done with acrylic um, PMMA, so you'll need some sort of acrylic for the pickup of the cylinders. And of course, some burrs to just drill the holes and, and cut the flanges and smooth everything out at the very end. So with the cylinders, like I was saying, I don't provide them, uh, but if you have to, um, if you have to supply the parts and if you have to stock inventory, uh, take a look. Um, Don, they actually carry this parts. I, you know, I, I didn't know they had all this variety um, for us to get. And not so much now, it's basically cylinders and analogs, but once you go to the digital stage and you need uh, the scan bodies and everything else, the, the, the analogs, the digital analogs for your parts, this is a brand that includes almost everything in terms of cylinders and, and compatible to different companies. And there's libraries for, for ExoCAD and for tree shape or for everything. So it's a really good, um, you know, uh, so the, this, this uh, company is really good to have and, and to know what kind of parts they have and what you will need. And then of course you'll need your dentures and the surgical stents, even if it's guided surgery, 
Um, I always bring a stent because if something goes wrong with that guide, uh, for some reason, I don't do um, stackable guides. My doctors don't do any stackable guides. Uh, so they might plan a case um, with, and, and have a, a, a guide, a surgical guide for, for the implant uh, placement. But I always make sure it doesn't cost much. Uh, duplicating a stent back then, it was like just tedious, not complicated, but tedious. Nowadays with digital technology, you can, you can do this in like five minutes and send it to your printer. But um, make sure that you have a stent. And if it's with an office that you don't know how they work, I would bring it because that will help you, um, you know, if something goes wrong in terms of the, the guide, uh, the surgical guide um, doesn't. So uh, like, you know, I, I mentioned before in different presentations and this probably you're seeing the same slides, um, the surgical stent is basically a clear duplicate of your denture and it helps you, uh, you the, the, the surgeon at the day of the surgery for um, bone reduction guide and restorative space. And the bone reduction guide is good. If I know that my hybrid, that is most of my cases are hybrids for finals. Uh, if I know that my hybrid needs a 15 millimeters of restorative space, I already marked that on my flanges of the denture. So once we go to surgery and the doctor is starting reducing the bone, he can confirm through my guide that we are okay with that space. And then um, of course, if you open that lingual, um, if you, open that um, cut all around the label of the denture that will help you with the selection of the multi-unit just to make sure that all your um, screw access holes are on the lingual and not in weird positions. Restorative platform. So we don't need to worry much about the different implant brands. Um, they're pretty much the same. All we need to know is that we're gonna use cylinders on top of them. But we do need to know if we're going to restore um, a case at the implant level or the abutment level. And the difference basically is that the implant level, the prosthesis goes straight to the implant. And that is um, when, you know, it has to be a very specific position because there's no changing on the, on the screw axis. So that implant, that cylinder goes straight to that implant and whatever axis is coming out, there's no way to change it. If you end up using that, at least try to do non-engaging fixture because you don't want them to engage um, into a locked uh, position of the implant because we're working with full arch, so we're working with multiple implants. So that is the, the internal connection that you see that uh, if it's on the implant, I love um, multi-unit abutments, I try to get all my doctors to get uh, on, on multi-units because it helps with the case a lot. It's an external connection from your cylinders and it's a lot easier to, to maneuver even for your final uh, restoration. One thing that you need to know about the abutments, and again, this is not something that I do, the surgeon is doing or the restorative doctor, but they rely a lot on me. Um, to tell them if it's okay or not. And I'm comfortable with that because I already know what to look for. I have my stent for that. And basically there's two different ways. Uh, there's two different uh, types of abutments. If the implant is a, in a great position and the screw access is already on the lingual of your teeth, you can they can just use a straight uh, abutment that is basically zero degrees. There's no degree, uh, uh, angulation whatsoever and you just they just place that abutment on that implant to make sure that you're changing the internal connection to external for your cylinder. In cases that we need to change the angulation of that implant then we can use the angulated abutments that most of the times is 17 degrees or 30. There are more different brands might have a 40 or others in between. I use always I work always with the same brand so the most um Commons are 17 and 30. So that's this. Um, so another thing that we need to consider is on the abutment level. And again, when I say consider, if they ask my opinion, um, is because again, they're the one placing them. Uh, the difference between the 17 degrees and the 30 degrees, besides the divergency, that is one is more than the other, the color height is all is also different. So the 17 degrees, the color height starts at two and a half millimeters 
while the 30 is three and a half. So I always try and hope that the 17 would fit because I'm not, I don't want that extra millimeter of height on my, on my um, restorative space, to, to, for, for my restorative space. So I wanna make sure that all the implants and the abutments of suppress all under the, 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 the tissue. So once it goes some, you know, while the patient is at the temporary stage and, and the healing, I don't have situations like this where the implants, the, the, the gums uh, shrink and now the implants are sticking out. And here is just a model that I made from the case, but you don't see the multi-unit abutment, but I can guarantee you that the patient will see the, the multi-unit abutment in the mouth. And then once we design our final, we wanna make sure that we don't cover those inputs, right? Because we wanna make sure they're um, cleansable and hygiene is a big thing with these cases because uh, we wanna make sure that they last and the implants don't fail and then they don't understand why they're seeing metal um, under the prosthesis and that the, that is the problem. Not so much, maybe the abutment um, choice was wrong or maybe the placement was not the, the best one in terms of the depth of the implant. But unfortunately, these are, at the very end, when that happens, there's not much more that we can do. So every time, if we have these considerations, every time we go to search, we can advise the doctor based on what we see and how some cases progress, we can advise the doctor and um, what to do in terms of a little deeper, a little to the side, rotate, you know, if you have that kind of relationship. That's why I think it's so important to have that kind of trust and relationship with your team that you're working. Another thing is um, the, again, this is based on the multi-unit abutments. Uh, we wanna make sure that we use a stent. Like I said, even if you do, if they do guided surgery, I would recommend to get a stent just to confirm because we have those parts. We have the multi-unit abutments to correct the position. We want to avoid to have cases like this. And unfortunately, their very first case, it was with an office that I didn't have any kind of relationship. Not even the surgeon and the restorative dentist had any kind of relationship. The surgeon would come in in the morning, place the implants, leave, the restorative doctor would come later, I would come in with my denture, and then we just had to work on what that surgeon did. And that is an unfortunate, unfortunate case because that shouldn't happen nowadays with all the, the information that we have. Uh, and again, just to reinforce um, the, the, uh, the, the, what we, the, in terms of the choice of the multi-unit abutments, if your abutment, according to the stent, uh, your implant hole is already coming through the single of the teeth, you don't need to place any multi-unit abutments, so you can just place it straight. Uh, if it's coming through the incisal edge, then that's when we can choose the 17 degrees. And then if you see that it's already through the lingual, through the buckle of the teeth, then you will definitely have to choose the 30 because you wanna make sure that hole is not coming through the teeth. Another um, detail that we should consider is when we're doing the holes to pick up the cylinders, you need to be very conservative. You don't wanna make wide holes because you're weakening your denture. And um, normally it's more or less, you want a one millimeter around the cylinders. That's why I like this um, round birds. I have, I don't think it's this specifically one. Um, I couldn't find uh, a, 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 a slide of, of the ones that I have, but I can try to find the later even with, with the sun. Uh, it's a very old bird that I have that is the right, it's just the right um, diameter for those holes. And that's what I use most of the times. I open one by one, and then I'll start widening those holes um, as minimum and, and best I can to avoid having crazy holes all around. Although, you know, small holes, you have to spend more time back and forth, do a little hole, try it in the mouth, come back and forth. If you widen too much, you're gonna end up having to add a lot more acrylic and it's a lot more, messy is a lot messier um, in order to do your conversion. So try to be conservative when you're drilling those holes. Another thing, and this is a big thing for me, is the height of the cylinders. And why, <laughs> why do I say that? It's because every single, you can go on YouTube and then type conversion process and 
there's a bunch of videos explaining how the conversion works. Uh, my problem that I have is with every single one of them, and this is just from three different ones that I search, they all say you have to cut the cylinders. Now, I understand that if the cylinder is slightly in the way, if you're trying to, to have the patient bite it down and it's kind of in, in the way, like a little one tread, maybe two, it's okay. But if you have to trim a lot or half of your cylinder, something is wrong. And why? If we go back to what I was saying um, before, your hybrid needs at least 15 millimeters of space. And let's say even if it's a zirconia, you need, uh, okay, 10, 11, 13 millimeters of space. Those cylinders um, are 10 millimeters. So if you have to cut half of one, you're not, you don't have your restorative space. So I always use those cylinders as a guide, or I used to before, uh, use as a guide to confirm that my restorative space was there. So I knew once I was going to my final, um, the restore the the my my uh, final restoration was going to have the proper um, the proper space. And this is just one of those cases. If you see, there's probably like three or four threads of the cylinders to to cut in there. So that is almost half five millimeters that I need to cut. And as you can see, that is not enough restorative space. And please don't look at this. <laughs> this is the very the the. This is uh, one of the my very first uh, cases uh, trying digital dentures. So <laughs> ignore all that. Just focus on the cylinders because it's so ugly. <laughs> Another thing will be the integral finishing. And yes, that's something that you have to your surgeons have to work on. And I'm very blessed with amazing surgeons that I work with that they do an amazing job. Uh, smoothing the bone and making sure that everything, all the tissue is nice and flat so I can do a good finishing under my, my temporary. You want it at least flat. If you have a convex, it's great, but you want to make sure that is at least flat. You don't want any, any concavities under the bridge. And, you know, uh, having tissues like carousel, just like that, it, it's going to, it doesn't look good. It's going to make your job more difficult. So if you can have that talk and convince your, your surgeons just to flatten the bone and flatten the tissue and make sure that everything is level, it helps a lot for the, um, for our final, for our, our work at the, the temporary and also at the final restoration. Uh, high water. I don't like to leave it high water. I like to have it um, contacting the tissue. I like to pressure the tissue a little bit just because I want to um, make sure that we're, we're, uh, you're, we're pressuring the tissue from the temporary conditioning it so our final doesn't have any issues with hygiene uh, later on. And of course, if this is, is not mine, I just grabbed it from some Facebook group from a patient that was complaining about something. And in fact, if you, for some reason, miss the planning or you're converting something that the patient already had and it creates some sort of a shelf like that, you could at least, uh, this is a no-no, of course, but you could at least smooth that edge so it's not such a uh, 90 degrees angle. At least you smooth it out so it's not forcing the lip so much. Another thing will be the AP spread. And the AP spread is basically the, the, the measure um, between the anterior, the two most anterior implants to the, to the two most posterior implants. And for your finals, uh, in terms of how far you can go with the cantilevers, you multiply that distance by one and a half and you know how many teeth you can go far back to your last um, implants. So for temporaries, you should just leave one tooth past that, uh, that cylinder. And um, sometimes I do get patient, uh, doctors that request, no, I want more teeth. Like we need to understand why because the more, the more cantilevers you leave, uh, once the patient is healing and the, the gums are shrinking, uh, th there are spacing under your temporary. And if you have a big cantilever in the back, the patient is gonna start biting, there's no support underneath and it's gonna break. So you wanna make sure that doesn't happen. So just leave one tooth um, only. Like this case here, it was, an unfortunate case, again, from that office that I had no clue uh, in terms of communication. 
uh, with them or between all the parts involved. I didn't work with them much because as you can see, all the cases that I had with them was always a problem. And this, I don't know what happened. They couldn't place an implant on the other side. And I, of course, I told them, well, we have to cut the, this denture by the canine because we cannot, we cannot extend the cantilever. And no, they wanted to, to have the rest of the teeth because the patient was going to complain. And of course, I told them that it was going to break. They didn't believe it. Three days later or two, two weeks later, I can't remember, they called that it broke. So that is something that we need to consider. And we need to make sure that we kind of step our foot into, no, this has to be like this. Um, of course, at the, at the very end, your doctor is the one dictating if he's a yes or a no, but at least you can advise them on why um, it will not be a good choice. So the surgery, and um, this is, I'm just going through the process um, a little bit faster because I'm spending a lot of time into the considerations, but again, it's something that I feel that are really important to understand because if you go to YouTube, the conversion process, you know pretty much what to do, but the pre-planning before, I think, is the crucial part of the entire case to be successful. So this case, it was going to be for a double arch. Um, I have the upper, um, all the steps for the upper, at least not so much for the lower, but uh, we go to surgery, the doctor pulls, um, removes all the remaining teeth. Uh, flaps the tissue, starts placing the implants, and start. Um, he's checking with my stent to see the position of those implants. So that picture is where the implant actually is. So I see that it's very close to the um, edge of the, te the, 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 the teeth. So I advise the doctor uh, to use the 17 degrees to kind of get away from the inside the that ed the incisal edge. We need a little bit more space in there. So we try um, all the abutments all around, we confirm with the stents, and then we start um, the, the conversion process. And it starts with marking, um, figure it out on the denture where those multi-unit um, abutments are in order for us to drill the denture. So we use blue mousse, we sit the denture on top. I, attend, I try to do this step um, at the very, um, first opportunity that I, I have, we still need to suture the, 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 the tissue. But at this stage, I don't want any cylinder in the way. I want to have to be as close as possible to the palate. And this is the best, um, the best time uh, to do that first initial impression. So we sit in the patient's mouth, it marks the orientation of the multi unit abutments. And I start drilling the denture. Again, like I said, I'm very conservative with the those holes, I don't start making wide holes right away. Um, the certain place the healing caps, sutures around, um, place the, the cylinders, and then we want to test the denture uh, through all the cylinders. We want to make sure that they're all uh, passive. The denture seats on top of all cylinders passively. Uh, sometimes I do one by one. I don't tend to do all five at the same time because if there's any deviation, you don't know which hole to open. So I tend to do um, one by one, just to make sure, again, that we're conservative, we're not opening the holes that much, and we go through the process a lot easier than placing all of them in the mouth and then going back and start removing it. And then um, rubber dam uh, to protect the tissue. And at the time I was using, um, ooh, this is, well, it's discontinued anymore, but uh, it's discontinued, so we can't use it anymore, but it was, um, it was a like your material. And the reason that I used to use it is because it would give me time uh, to inject uh, the acrylic around the, the, the cylinders and on the denture and sit it together. You can do the same thing with acrylic. Um, you can just mix it and put it in a syringe and do exactly the same thing. You just have to be careful or know that some acrylics, they get hot and uh, most likely they need to irrigate. So uh, we need to consider that when you're picking um, the right uh, acrylic for this type of cases. So we see the denture, and like I said, this material particularly, um, it was light cure, so it would give me time to maneuver the denture, add acrylic around, and then I will cure it with a Valo light. That is a powerful light. I use it a lot, and this is the only one, at least that I know, and that I can guarantee that it will cure any material through the acrylic 
through the through the, the denture. So the that resin was on the inside of the the denture, and that light was powerful enough to penetrate through the acrylic and um, and cure uh, this this resin. Once it's done, we unscrew the the the, the denture. Now that is already uh, already has the cylinders. We remove, we finish everything up, we polish, and then we finish. Um, we we bring it back to 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 the office or to to the room, so the patient can so it's ready for your uh, lower. So when every time I have a double arch, I'll finish the upper. I'll have it ready, and then once we go to the lower. For the conversion process, I always use the bite, so I want to have that ready uh, prior. So you can do it both at the same time, but I prefer to do it this way. So on the lower, I don't have many photos, but basically it's the same thing. Uh, extract the teeth, confirm the bone reduction, um, the dorsorty space that we have enough with our stent, and then place the implants. And again, once my upper is done, we place it in and we do, when we do the conversion with the lower, we want to make sure that the upper is in place because we're, we want to use the bite as a guide uh, for that bite. I hate when my doctor spend 10 minutes adjusting bite, uh, let alone 20. So I'm very specific with the pickup process. I want to make sure that we use the patient's bite. And I know sometimes they're called they're asleep and the, the, the anesthesia, they don't bite. You kind of have to learn how to maneuver the, the jaw and, and kind of bring it in place. And this is how um, it turned out. This was uh, the next day. <clears throat> so we're just going through um, treatment plan and, and the, the conversion the same day. I kind of went over different things. This is a patient with extreme changeable display, a lot of inflammation. Um, these are the photos that I received. So I got my impressions. I articulated the case, um, start making my, my marks for my bone reduction, um, setting the teeth, process the denture, and uh, the day of the surgery, again, this is um, a lot <laughs> of uh, gingival reduction, bone reduction in there. Uh, so we reduce the, the teeth were extracted. Uh, the doctor, the surgeon remove uh, all that extra um, bone, start placing the implants. And then we use our stent to confirm that the multi-unit abutments uh, are uh, in the right position. We want to make sure that the holes are coming through the lingual of the teeth and it has enough space around, you know, they're close to the teeth, but not too close to, to um, interfere with the longevity of your restoration. And then what I love, like this is one of my favorite surgeons, what he does when he opens the flap, um, he does it from the buccal side. So once he has to suture, he uses like a tissue puncher or punt, I don't even know what to call, but he pulls the tissue over the implants. He makes the precise hole through the, the healing caps and all the suturing is basically on the buckle. And that helps a lot because sometimes we don't even use, need to use, depending on the acrylic that you're using. Uh, I would even uh, use rubber dam anymore because the sutures were not in the way. So this is very specific. The surgeon has to be uh, willing to do this type of uh, suturing. So we have the denture, we inject, in this case, it wasn't blue mousse, but it's just some uh, bite registration material, which seated on in the mouth. We use the palate we, to, to seat the denture. We can confirm that there's no gingival um, display or the flange, the, the, the gums are not showing on the patient's mouth once we seat it. So we are good with where the teeth position is and the bone reduction and everything else. Um, we start drilling the holes based on that um, bite registration that was done. And once the, um, the holes are done, we place certain places, the cylinders, we seat the denture through the cylinders, make sure they're all um, passive. And well, the denture seats passively through the cylinders and there's enough room around um, those cylinders to inject the new acrylic, place the cylinder, um, place, um, Teflon tape to, to make sure that there's no acrylic going to the holes. The worst thing that it can happen is not being able to access one of those screws. Uh, denture is seated and we can uh, start picking up. So as you can see, um, the height of the cylinders. I didn't trim anything, uh, any part of those cylinders. They are the full length. And in this particular case, I had to play with the vertical 
dimension and the, 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 the bone reduction. So there's a lot involved in this case in particular because there was such a amount of, of gingival display to work with. But in this case, I didn't treat any, any of my cylinders. I have all the restorative space that I need for my final. So we started injecting the acrylic. I inject around the cylinders on the dentures, seated. Again, this is my old material that I was using was still like here. Um, and then uh, once it's done, you remove the Teflon tape, unscrew those cylinders, and you can go to the lab to just remove the flanges, remove all the extra acrylic and make it nice and uh, pretty to deliver. So sometimes depending how the um, acrylic was picked up, sometimes you might need to turn it around and level a little bit uh, the intaglio of, the, um, of your temporary, just make sure that you don't add too much depending how you did your pickup, because if you just turn it around and start injecting, then you're not gonna be able to seed it um, in the mouth later. So you need to be very careful with the amount of acrylic that you're adding after um, the, the pickup process itself. And this is something that um, I used to do um, just to make it easier moving forward. Now, if you do conversion next day that I'll just um, go over next, you will need some sort of impression because you need to do the conversion in the lab, not in the patient's mouth. But this is something that I started doing right away uh, when I started doing these cases because with five minutes, um, within five minutes, you can just create a model from your conversion. So you just in, you just uh, screw some analogs, you click stone, a five minute set, you can make a model and you can inject a little bit of um, even blue mousse if you have to, but silicone just to simulate the gums. If you do this process that it will, it will only take five minutes of your time, you can at least save one appointment or two to your doctor later on for your verification shakes because you already have the implant position and you can fabricate a shake right away on this model, because you're gonna section, right? Once you go to final impressions, you're gonna section your jigs. Um, the patient is gonna connect it in the mouth. So with this step, you're saving the doctor and the patient an appointment, just having them in, remove the temporary, do an open tray impression just to have that implant position um, when you can do it um, right now. So I used to have some doctors that would call it a repair jig. I never, and sometimes they would request, like, can I keep the model? Like, I try not to, because I don't consider it as a repair model, because it, this was done very fast. The, the stone is like a quick set. I do not trust this model for a repair. So if for some reason there is a breakage of the temporary, it needs to be repaired in the mouth. And I'm very particular with that, because if there's any tension um, with with that it made the denture, the, 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 the temporary break, if you bring it back to this model, you're creating the same tension because the model was done based on what it was, um, you know, initially. And of course, the contraction and everything that goes into this stone, because it's so quick set, it, it's different than the mouth. So I always recommend if there's something that needs to be repaired. And again, this is old analog way because with the digital technology now, there's a lot more things that we can do and we can just reproduce a new temporary um, with the right records. But old school, you know, this way, at least you have a model, you have the implant position, you can speed up the process in terms of the verification jigs for your doctors down the road. But I would never use one of these models to do a repair. I would prefer, I would advise the doctor to do it in the mouth every single time because there's no more passive um, model than the mouth itself. And then we brought it, uh, we insert the, the, the conversion back in and this was the result. This was right after surgery and we were all very happy and relieved <laughs> because uh, it's not easy to work with just photos on the side and your models and you know, it's, uh, I say that the conversion process is easy because making the holes in the denture and go through the, the, the workflow is not difficult. The main part is honestly the planning and make sure that the teeth are planned in the right position and you account for all those little things and details that you have to um, for this type of restorations. And this is how uh, she looked um, before, this was actually before uh, the finals, the, the, the time that she came back for final impressions. 
So I am going over just a couple of steps for the next day conversion. I don't do this. I never did. I refuse to do it. Uh, I always said, I don't want to spend my, you know, I, I don't want to use two days for the same patient. If we can do it in one day, I want to do it that way. Um, but the reality is that is a lot, there are a lot of offices and, and dental laboratories and even doctors that they prefer to do it the next day. They prefer to um, have the, the patient come in, do the surgery, take all the records, and then the patient just goes to, to, to next day to have the bridge inserted. Um, these are some steps that I was given by another office that they wanted me to work with them. And they kind of went over with me. This is what they were looking for to do. Um, so these slides are not mine, but I figured that it's good to know because I know there are still a lot of offices that they do it this way. So for the next day conversion, basically you will still have your denture. It's just that instead of drilling the whole four, five, six holes, whatever restoration, uh, all four, all six, uh, you're restoring, you just drill two holes on the interior for the two anterior um, cylinders. And this photo is deceiving <laughs> where I, I, you know, they, this doctor told me, well, you, sometimes we adjust the, the posterior um, of the denture to seat on top of the multi-units. Okay, if the patient has a denture, then I agree because, uh, and if there's enough restorative space, the multi-unit, it will interfere. But if you're planning a denture, uh, you should plan with that restorative space. So I don't see why, if it was another case, if it's a denture that you're planning, I don't see why you will need, you will have to have the need to adjust the denture and the need just because you should have enough space there for a cylinder. So um, in this case, again, instead of picking up all four, it's just two. So you make the two anterior holes for those two cylinders, some rubber dam, you protect the cylinders and then I don't understand why they would do some markers on the lingual also to inject. You can inject from the buckle, from the occlusal and then have the patient bite down. But these are just the only photos that I have because they were shared with me. I never did one of those cases, so I apologize. This doesn't look uh, the best or it might even be different if you're doing already the next day conversion. It might be slightly different. Again, this is not something that I do, but I thought that share because um it was it was showed to me by, by by another office and then once the acrylic is set you remove and of course in this case oh what am i doing so sorry in this case um if if you do it the next day you need a model right so you need to do some sort of verification jig and um i I don't do them. <laughs> I don't do them anymore. But uh, back then, again, because I would, I would um, pour that model from the day of the surgery, I would have that model already and fabricate the jig from there. If you're in the condition that you don't have any records and you have to do it in the mouth, the, the, the doctor can do wire or plastic tubes or whatever. Uh, but that sometimes, sometimes it takes uh, a little bit of time and if you're in surgery they just want to get done with it i would recommend to look into this easy bar um is i use them for a couple of um years before i transition to the digital workflow but is uh basically a kit that it has different lengths of metal of little bars that you can just slide through the cylinders uh based on the the distance between the the the, the different cylinders and just use a little bit of a duralay and bond it together and then you can do your final impression. Um, meter trays are amazing for this. You don't have to customize a regular standard tray and opening um, the holes um, through, through that tray. So it's a lot faster if you're in that stage of rushing. And then uh, once you pour the model, of course, condition a little bit the, the model, make sure that you make it a little flat um, so you can add a little bit of more uh, acrylic once you're processing um your 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 temporary um for uh pressure on the intaglio once it's delivered and then again this i <laughs> this is the picture that they showed me um i think that you could do a nicer job in in um you know finishing up that conversion in the model so don't look at the picture ignore just get the concept that 
once you have a master cast and you have those, uh, you have a master cast from the jig that was done in the mouth and you have that denture with two anterior cylinders picked up, then you can just sit it in the, in the model and then just add acrylic as you go or wax and then process depending on how, how you want to handle that in the lab. And uh, then once it's done, you're finishing it up and then you can ship it to the doctor or to, to, the, to the office for the next day to be inserted um, on the patient's mouth. And with this, oh my God, I am so sorry because I feel that I had so much to talk about and I was trying to keep my limit within the hour and I kind of felt like I rushed through a couple of things. So I apologize for that. Um, but I do thank you for um, attending. This is my, you know, my social, I'm not very great at social media, but uh, my email, if you have any questions, please, if you have anything particular to that you want to, uh, you know, know, uh, feel free to reach out to me. But uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I rushed through the entire thing so fast, but I wow. felt like I was looking at the time, everything was like <laughs> a lot to talk about. And I, I have to say, we have a part two coming. Uh, and uh, I don't know, friend, if you want to say something, but we do have another part coming in, I think two weeks. I'll try to compile a little less so I'm, I don't, I don't have to rush through this. Sure, I think you did great. I think all the attendees would say the same. We do have a question though. And the first question comes from Eugene and he wants to know, do you ever use a bite registration jig to align the lower to upper while doing the conversions? Yes, so yes, uh, yes and no. So I use it at the beginning, every time when we are doing the, the, the making sure that the lower denture seats on the, um, on the lower jaw, I always use the bite because it's a lot easier to have those two pieces together. When you have teeth to teeth, some doctors, they cannot hold it and they're, 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 it's hard to, to, to make that um, articulation. So the bite registration helps, yes. But at the very end, when I am picking up the cylinder, well, when the doctor is picking up the cylinders, I do it without a bite because I wanna make sure that I see all the contacts uh, between the teeth. Excellent, thank you so much, Dora. Um, I just wanna let everybody know again that Dora will be back with us at Zon Academy for part two of Denture Conversions Analog to Digital Workflow. And that will be on February 8th, um, again, 2 p.m. Eastern. She will be coming and doing a table clinic for us over at Lab Day Chicago. And that will be on February 25th, 1.15 to 2.15, and that'll be in the Zahn Grand Ballroom, E and F. So registration is open for both. And if you'd like to register, please go to Zahn Academy and uh, follow the link over to the registration. I wanna let everybody know, we do have some more upcoming um, education for February. And that is going to be on Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, deep dishing with me and a bunch of industry experts talking about Lab Day Chicago 2023. So join myself, Lee Culp, Dennis Urban, Jessica Love, formerly Burrell, Min Tron, Joseph Young, Megan Nakanishi, and Nicole Jackson. That'll be 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern on February 15th. We have another question, Dora. Okay. In your photos, you showed triad resin. Is that what pickup resin you use? And what shade is that? Yes, yeah, so now um, Triad is discontinued. Even the, um, oh my God, Dual Line. Here we go. Dual Line was the, the resin that I was using to pick up the, 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 the cylinders that was like here. That is discontinued. So I use Q resin um, uh, by Braydent. And the reason that I use it is, is good for printed dentures and also acrylic denture, so you can use it with both. And uh, you don't have to mix, you know, it's, it already comes in a cartridge and, um, and that they put the gun in and you inject and it has about three minutes of working time. And I think it's plenty, it's not too flowable, is I think is the right consistency for what we want to go around the cylinders and everything. And again, this is all process unless it's an implant system that I don't, um, have the parts for. If it's not multi-unit compatible, then I would use this 
workflow because um, because of that specific implant. But every single case that is multi-unit compatible now, I use um, another uh, type of a conversion. That, that's the second part. Um, and I use the, the Q resin for, for all of them. For that's I, I change. I don't use acrylic anymore just because I like the consistency. I like the 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 the, the working time, and it just works with better with, with the new workflow now that we're going to talk next. <laughs> but yes, the the resin I don't use the those anymore. I use Q resin if I have to even do one of these cases. I'll use Q resin. That's the material that I'm comfortable with. I used to. I I tried quick up. It worked for a couple of time, a couple of times, but then the consistency was not there. The setting time was not there. So I've been very happy with the Q resin uh, for a couple of years now. Sure, we have uh, some for, uh, some results for the poll right now, and what we see is forty one percent of our attendees are doing denture conversions, and fifty nine percent are not. So I thought that would be interesting for you to hear. So hopefully I was, <laughs> I gave enough insight to maybe look into it. I think it's very um, preferable, but uh, you, do ra you do really have to go with the right mindset to these cases. You're not just going to do some sort of task. You're working with a patient. You're trying to change that patient's, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're changing the life of that patient with this type of uh, workflow so or with this type of work so you need to go with the right mindset and work towards um, you know all the little details and, and making sure that the outcome is what you want and, and to be successful it's you cannot just go in well it's just another type of work it's very more it's more than that, but maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just I'm. I'm being. I've been doing this for so long that I kind of got attached to the patients. And sometimes I see, you know, I see when something doesn't go well and something goes wrong. I, you know, sometimes you blame yourself. You, it's it's a weird <laughs> situation to be in. But you, you know, hopefully I gave enough information to just know what to look for. And if they in fact want to start doing these cases, at least they have an idea of the little details to know how to start planning these and then has just how to start incorporating them or at least to talk with some doctors maybe the reality is that some doctors are not comfortable doing this they want to do these cases but they're not comfortable because maybe they don't know enough they had a bad experience in the past if you show them that you care and you know and do you try your best um there's a lot of opportunities for this type of cases and Late, lately, for the last two, three years, I've seen, I've been crazy busy, completely booked with these cases. And this is all I do. So I don't do anything else. I don't do crown and bridge. I don't do dentures. I just do the conversions. I feel my specialty is chair side, the doctor for this type of cases. And I've been swamped with these cases. So it's not because it's me. I know the need is there. So a lot more people should get into that because this is... I don't want to say the trend, but there's a lot more patience now for this type of cases. So the more um, comfortable you're getting, you know, starting these cases, the faster you can start doing them. <laughs>